Hello? Hello? Your guitar, yes, good. I have my video disabled for now since I'm actually hunkering down at our parents' uh, cellar and they haven't really bought into this fiber game yet. Yeah, I'll just share my presentation. I have a setup of iPad and laptop and a pile of soldering gear holding them all up on a table here. So we'll see what, if you see, if you hear like a rambling sounds, that's just my delicate setup crumbling down. Uh, welcome to Tech Talk. Let's talk about content delivery networks and let's look more on sort of what's under the hood for the content delivery networks. So first off, hello, my name is Jyrki. Uh, I do work in Helsinki office. Uh, at the moment, I'm located in Salo, which is a small town in south southwest uh, Finland. But uh, I work as a tech advisor at Futurize. I joined in January. Uh, but before I came in as a tech advisor to the Futurize, I used to work as a product manager at Spotify. And for the last three and a half years, I ran a team that had the whole Spotify content delivery uh, under its belt. So. I've been in a deep in the trenches with the content delivery networks, and I thought maybe this is something very interesting to share to all of you. And during this talk, if you have any questions that pop up while I'm, while I'm going through the talk, please use the chat to record them down, and then I'll make sure to save some time in the end to be able to answer the questions. All right, so in the talk, we're gonna have a brief intro, like what actually is a content delivery network, and we're gonna look what companies do run those kind of delivery networks and then we get more into the meat of the presentation why should you or why sh you shouldn't use one and we'll kind of look actually pop the hood and look what actually happens under the hood in the kind of the, uh, the cdns like how how do you actually how do you actually build a cdn basically and then we're gonna look into how you how can you, how should you choose a provider like this multiple cdn providers like I, I can give you a few practical tips on how to choose between them. Uh, let's start with some glossary because I'll be using these terms so that you know what I'm talking about. So CDN is content delivery network. Sometimes it's also referred as a content distribution network. Edge means in this case, the actual CDN node, like the bunch of servers that sit, sit uh, the, where the traffic exits to the uh, end user. Like sometimes these, on the delivery networks are like onions with a lot of layers, but there's always an edge where the traffic exists towards the, your, your end user, which is like your browser, your mobile phone, whatever. Uh, there's origin. That's the place where the original content is stored. That's the place where you store your content. Uh, usually it's like a block storage, like S3 or Google Cloud storage. And, and the CDN pulls the content from there. It's also good to note that this can also be, you know, a server somewhere. It doesn't need to be a block storage or anything like it can be basically anything accessible, uh, usually over HTTP. And then there's a pop or point of presence, which is a physical location where the CDN provider has set up a bunch of the servers. All right. So what is a content delivery network? Well, content delivery networks are, first of all, responsible for the majority of the traffic uh, online. Uh, I tried to find a good overview of this, but it's a very hard thing uh, to find like who actually generates all the traffic. But if you look at only at the all the media streaming, that's already over 50%. The largest one there tends to be Netflix, but also for the rest of that, like there's, you know, Windows updates, Fortnite updates, that's kind of bonker stuff that actually pushes a lot of data around the internet. And all of this flows through different content delivery networks. Uh, they are a network of servers that are very specialized in efficient content delivery. So basically highly optimized way of shoveling bytes out of the door. So they try to be as efficient as possible, just moving content, aka bytes around. Uh, and they also are bunch of additional services that are sort of built on top of this like very highly optimized byte shoveling business right and the next question is that who are they in theory you could split them or in practice you can split them in two th different categories you have public cdns and you have private cdns so the public cdns are the ones that we usually talk about uh, and you know which we actually use ourselves those are like the cloud providers and the separate companies actually uh, like there are separate companies only doing CDNs as a business. Uh, and 
examples in there are like Akamai, which is the largest one of the uh, CDN companies. There's Fastly. Uh, and then you can have the call provider ones like Amazon CloudFront or Google Cloud CDN. But then there's a lot of private CDNs. I already talked about Netflix. So they are a C CDNs that are serving only the needs of the one specific company. So you have Netflix, Apple runs their own, own CDN. Apple actually does a, I think they use three CDNs. They have their own CDN, then they do a Akamai, and I think it's Limelight, the third one they use. Uh, Spotify, uh, the thing I used, I did build or help to build. I have a product manager. It's a, it's an, you can have an argument how much building that in, involves. Uh, but we also use like Akamai and Fastly on the side of the, uh, on the, our own CDN. And there's Google who has their own CDN mainly for YouTube. It is roughly the same product as Google Cloud CDN, but it's not quite the same. And then Facebook has their own CDN. Uh, here in the private CDNs, there's a notable, notably there's lacking Amazon, like they have their cloud front, but Amazon actually being Amazon, for example, distributes the prime video via Akamai. So they don't actually internally use cloud from that much, which I find fairly hilarious. Uh, then there are a bunch of companies that appear as CDNs, but are actually just reselling white label products. Like if you contact Telia, they will sell you Verizon Edge cost. Or if you take Azure CDN, that'll be a Akamai or Verizon Edge cost. And I think at Azure CDN, you can even choose which one of those you want to use. All right. So there's some background uh, briefly. So why should you use one? Or why shouldn't you use one? Uh, I'd say you should. Definitely use CDN if you want lower latency. There are a few reasons. Like sometimes if you use block storages like GTS or S3, they can be slow. At Spotify, we had like, I don't know, 95th percentile latency. The first byte was like 15 seconds with GCS. That's like very bonkers. S3 is a bit better, but you know, sometimes they can be very slow. Uh, your content might also be physically far away. Like if you take AWS in Ireland or the GCP Europe West. Which is in Belgium, like that's actually a you know tens of milliseconds away. Even even like a, if you just do like a direct line and measure on Google Maps, so it's going to take some time for content to move there. And it actually makes sense to use a CDN that is closer to your end user. If we look at Finland, for example, then the closest or pretty much every single CDN resides either in Stockholm and even some of them like Akamai Fastly. Uh, reside in Finland. Actually, they are on that in Finland. If you, a third reason could be that can be that your user base might be geographically distributed, and then you know no single availability zone of your cloud provider makes sense. So you know you want to use the CDN so that you get the con content close to close to those users. Uh, they can also do stuff like TLS termination. So you know they can do the whole TLS handshaking and termination part close to the user. And if you think about TLS 1.2, which is like the initial connection is like is like four or five round trips. I should know this, but I can't remember. Uh, then you can imagine like if all of them are going to be like 40 milliseconds further away, that's going to be like 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds easily extra. And sometimes it can also be beneficial to route calls to your backend through a CDN. But I would be, you know, sometimes it actually makes sense. I would be a bit wary on that. Uh, the CDN providers tend to sell these like acceleration products or or like acceleration solutions for APIs, but you can get in the pick, pickle of like cache invalidation in those. And it's a, also a question if they actually are faster because it's good to remember that even if you're using Google Cloud in, uh, say you use Google Cloud in, in Europe West, which is Belgium, your traffic is going to hit Google's backbone in Stockholm or Hamina in Finland and go, gonna go there very fast. Another another use case is that you have a very uneven distribution of access on your static content. So this is like the classic, you know, the Spotify use case where, I don't know, 80% of our traffic was like 5% of the whole catalog. So there's a lot of objects that are requested often, which means that they're very good fit for CDNs. Like they stick to the CDN caches, they're always very fast. I bet this is the case with a lot of different sites. And you know, this can be your logos on your website. This can be, uh, if you think about like, I don't know, what our projects there are, like Sonoma maybe, maybe the news streams that people watch. Uh, if there's content that you know comes out and creates a sudden spike, uh, the CDNs are very good at uh, 
handling thundering herds. So when, aka when like a bunch of users want to reach to the bunch of users are reaching out for the same object, they have a lot of logic of actually just pausing the request, fetching the stuff from your origin, caching it, and then serving it out to the users. So they actually cut down costs and latency quite a lot for a bunch of users by just stalling them a bit while you while they're fetching the data from your origin. Uh, CDS can also be a very neat extra layer of security for your content. They are very good at DDoS mitigations. Like that's, you know, they are any CDN providers are pretty yummy sort of target for uh, distributed denial of service attacks. So they have gotten very good at handling those attacks. So you can just drop the CDN in place and let it take the heat. Uh, they can offer other sort of added protection as a you know additional product they sell. Like you can have limited lifespan URLs uh, while still you know enjoying all the caching benefits. Uh, they can offer you web application firewalls. They do bot detection and all kinds of funky stuff. Uh, they can also help you hide your implementation details, so you don't you know don't expose your origin. You know you don't necessarily want to pipe stuff through the directly through the S3 and GCS, like both for maybe security reasons of not revealing using it, and also for you know just general developing sanity of not exposing too much implementation details. And they can also improve redundancy if you if you if that's a very big thing for you. Like you could have multiple origins. Like you could have the same files in say Azure and Amazon and you could put one seed in in front of it and which picks from one or the other if the other one is, doesn't work. You should definitely use CDNs if you're streaming content, uh, because most of them have very heavily optimized paths for streaming. There's immediate gains by just caching only the most requested segments. So if you're streaming video, which traditionally is like you know four second segments, but maybe people don't watch all of them. And in, in like streaming here is like both live streaming and video on demand. So it will actually be you know very smart. The CDN by design is smart in sort of caching all those segments that people actually watch from the video. They usually come with a lot of, you know, infrastructure if you want to go for live streaming, if you would be doing like, I don't know, live TV, sport events, that kind of stuff. They do have a lot of specifically built infrastructure handling that those, uh, like a live content streaming uh, and very low latency live content streaming if needed. And they also offer Usually, like on the fly transcoding, so you know you you just pipe stuff in there, and on the fly they will generate like H two six five, web them, and other formats you might need on the on the actual end devices. But then uh, use with caution, like if you want to save some money, uh, this is I see this often, like oh you should use CDN to save some money, and yes, it is possible to save some money with CDNs uh, because usually they are cheaper than the cloud egress, aka the traffic you pay for your content to exit the cloud. Like if you if your content exits to S3 or GCS or a just you know compute instance in the cloud, they tend to be cheaper than that cost per gigabyte in the network. But this also is heavily tied to your access pattern. So you need to have hot content that sticks to the CDNs. Otherwise, there's no savings to be made, only money money wasted in that process. Uh, you should also use with caution, like if you want to compose images. I think this is one very interesting product, both Fastly and Akamai offer. There's probably others also at the market. So they offer a highly flexible image processing product, which can actually save manual image editing work. Uh, this product itself sits very well in the CDN, sort of as, you know, in their infra. Uh, and you know they do automatic retranscoding. Like you go with an Android phone, they detect that one, or you have a Chrome, and they give you WebP. And they do a lot of like logic on based, you know, your network conditions and yada yada yada. They also enable stuff of like, oh, you have an image, you can put the label on it. Uh, these are very amazing products, but they are also very expensive. So you know, cost might creep up when you look at the additional products as you're using. Uh, we used these products at Spotify. They were very nice. We used them for very specific cases. We couldn't use them for all the catalog because the prices would have skyrocketed. I know for a fact that BBC and Guardian both actually generate most of their like uh, news news images where you have like Guardian logos or other like elements layered on top of them. They programmatically generate them using the, the services, and they are very neat in that sense. Maybe a part of the CDNs you didn't know existed before, right? Uh, and don't use if all your 
objects are roughly equally likely to be fetched. Sort of a no-brainer. No like if, if they're all equally likely to, likely to be fetched, you just end up rotating items in and out of the seed and caches, and you end up paying for both sides. Like you end up paying for the money for exiting your origin, like S3 in this case, for example, and you end up paying for the CDN traffic going out from the CDN. Plus, you also probably get like you know whatever latency benefits you were looking for. They're sort of gone because very often you have to refetch the stuff from the origin, and then it needs to go out from the CDN again. You shouldn't use it if you keep reusing the same URL with different content. I know this is not the stuff that people tend to do, but you know sometimes this happens. All of the CDN support full or partial cache invalidations. So you can say like, hey, I want to drop this object, aka URL from the cache, or you know, I want to dump the whole cache on the floor. But those can be very slow, depending on the implementation. They, uh, they are sort of inconsistent or eventually consistent. Uh, so you're never really re entirely sure when has, to, when has the content disappear from the other CDN nodes around the world. Uh, it's they also tend to have like rate limits, so you can't just use them as much as you like. The cache invalidation can be costly because the content needs to be refetched from the origin. Uh, as an example, when we were using like the largest largest nodes we had in our own CDNs at Spotify, like if we dumped a cache on those, that was roughly a fifteen k dollars down the drain because just for the fetching the content again from GCS, right? Uh, and the client side caches can sometimes be really stubborn and you might make mistakes. Like going back to the image of, image of consistency, like you dump an object from a CDN cache, your client by accident goes to a different CDN node, it's still there. The old version, your client caches that one, and then you know you have this very inconsistent views. Like, why does stuff look different between clients? So you shouldn't use CDNs in a case where you want to reuse the actual same URL with different content, like or or you would really, really battle the, need to battle this to the setup. All right, so that was about uh, how uh, or when you should use it or uh, when not. So the next question is that how is CDN formed? So first off, part of the latency part to get close to the end users, you need those pops, those points of presence. This is a map of fastest locations. You can see that like they're roughly all around the world, like pretty much every single global CDN provider looks like this. Like, unfortunately, none of them have like nodes in like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, like everyone has nodes in South Africa and then the rest of the Africa is blank. Usually they don't have nodes in China and Russia because they're a bit touchy, touchy regions, but you know, they look roughly like this if you have a global CDN player. Uh, that said, like if you would bootstrap a new CDN, you're probably fine by having yourself in certain locations in US and Europe because that's where sort of a lot of the traffic still goes on in those regions. And also, in, if you are only serving users in US and Europe, there's a lot of options to pick from CDN providers. Anyway, but you need need some pops. Then you need you also need some networking. So there's not just one internet, even though it looks like it from the outside. You need multiple interwebs to be connected. Like this, there is thing called transit. So there are what are called a tier one network providers. There's Telia Carrier, the Swedish one, uh, NTT from Japan, CenturyLink from US, Liberty Global from UK. These are companies that run the global backbones of internet, like you know the, the submarine cables, all that jazz. Uh, unfortunately, this stuff is also very expensive. Like uh, if you only use the transit links, they're going to be very expensive to use. So then you want to connect to what's called internet exchange points. In Finland, there's FIGIX. In Stockholm, there's NetNode and STHIX. Uh, in Germany, in Frankfurt, there's DKIX. In Netherlands, is AMSIX. London is Lynx. The internet ex exchange points, where by the way, DKIX and M6 are like the second or third biggest ones in the world are places where like everyone gets together. Uh, unfortunately, the, the cable spaghetti, which is from Stockholm, from NetNode, is not visible on the right side that well. Uh, but basically, everyone gets there, connects together, and then this internet exchange points just like exchanges traffic between these parties. And that way, you don't need to pay the transit carrier. You only pay fixed fee to the 
exchange point for having that port set up. However, the, the, since you can imagine this as, you know, you have one cable that goes to the exchange, let's say 100 gigabits per second, and then there's like 2,000 clients in there. So you have to split your 100 gigabit per second bandwidth with all these 2,000 parties you want to connect into. So then you want to go to the next level, which is that you want to have private network interconnect. So uh, say me as a Spotify want to serve Elisa customers in Finland, we get this, or it goes the other way around. Like if you if you are an ISP like Elisa, they are like, holy crap! Like Spotify is sending a lot of traffic towards us. They're gonna send email out to Spotify, like, hey, would you like to peer with us? And then we are like, jolly good, because now we can send you sort of traffic for free. So we actually patch cables between Elisa's network and Spotify's network directly, right? And that's also a free or fixed monthly fee kind of traffic. And then, of course, for all this stuff, you want some redundancy, like whether you pick another route, if something toasts, toasts or misbehaves and so forth. In addition to networking, you need some hardware, right? Effectively, you want to maximize network and storage capacity. So network capacity basically translates to not only raw gigabytes per second, which is like very important that you have enough bandwidth, but you also do what I was trying to explain previously. You need a lot of ports. So for every network you're going to connect into, you need a port. On the right side, you can see a what's called Arista 7280R. It was like a 48 port switch we ran. I think six of the ports were 100 gigs. 42 of them were like 10 gigs. And we usually managed to get them pretty damn full when we were running our CDNs. And, and the Spotify CDN had no redundancy whatsoever. It was a glorious design. Then you need some disk. And then you're like, oh, should I have SSDs? SSDs are nice because they're fast. You can do a lot of. It's cheap to do random access, which is like very common scenario for the C, for the CDN use case. But you know, buying eight terabyte SSDs is going to get quite expensive. Uh, while you know, if you go for spinning disks, you might get much more cash space uh, cheaper by going to the spinning disk. And then you can see, like, I know that Akamai, for example, has a sort of both of these, and they. Offer and they try to decide if it's the better for the client stuff to reside on a spinning disk or uh, SSDs and try to sort of balance the, the stuff on their side. You also want lots of RAM. Uh, you need the RAM for, of course, like you know, caching and that kind of stuff. But also high-speed networking is very interesting in the sense that it is a lot of RAM. It also needs a specific kind of CPUs. Then you need all kinds of funky infra like firewalls, like you know, physical firewall devices, out of band management, you know, where you can connect to your box when it doesn't boot and that kind of stuff. And then you get back to this like, oh, the redundancy, like if this is if one part is gonna go toast, like are you gonna tell your customers like whoops, your data went A wire. So you probably want some, you know, redundant disks, redundant machines, redundant uh, switches and so forth. Then you need some software to run on those CDNs. Uh, you need the caching software, the actual pizza boxes like the servers. If you just go off the shelf software on open source side, there's Warnish, but every single big player runs their own software. Uh, for example, Fastly forked Warnish at like, I think Varnish 2. Point something, and then they basically have been like rewriting it from the inside out over time. The caching strategies between CDM players are slightly different, but the gist is that this is the same, like all of them end up using some sort of LRU cache where they are, might be slightly smarter on like, you know, storing large objects versus small objects and that kind of stuff. You need also a lot of logic to handle the sort of multi-tenant environment so that not single client just eats all of your, uh, all of your disk. And you need a lot of logic for handling redundancy of the network. Like you need to figure out like, whoops, this network link no longer takes me where I want to. I need to reroute the traffic. And then you also need a lot of infra outside your pops. In the picture, here's a tape robot. Don't mind it. It took care of Spotify's backups next to our CDN pop in Bromma, Sweden. But you need, you know, control plane for routing traffic. Usually that's DNS or any cast. So DNS, you know, you ask the cloud front, you, you point your browser to a cloud front endpoint, and the cloud front endpoint replies, you know, to your DNS query with the closest pop or 
sometimes like Google, for example, offers any cache where you have a signal IP routing to whatever is the closest Google. You also need a really good analysis of the internet weather. You need to, you need to be able to spot like when some optical circuit has gone post and the traffic is looking bad and you need to be able to reroute stuff. You need a bunch of spare gear available. You need, you need people to build those pops and fix the hardware. And then you for the private network interconnect part, you need people, uh, people who, what, you need someone to get familiar with people running the internet uh, over drinks because that's basically how you exchange traffic. Like you go to this conference, you drink a lot of alcohol, and wake up with a bunch of you know ex traffic exchange deal deals in your pocket the next morning. Choosing a CDN. Uh, so should you choose a cloud provider or a separate CDN provider? Or the cloud provider CDN or a separate CDN? Uh, for the cloud provider, like the CloudFront or the Google Cloud CDN, it's a good choice if you're already using that cloud and you only want to make things a bit faster. Your scale is small, like you know, you're not aiming for some uh, crazy global thingy wingy. Uh, you're not doing a lot of streaming. Uh, this is more on like a personal testing point. We never found this very suitable for streaming purposes. They they do work, but may, they are not the best if you want to go very deep in the nitty gritty details, and you want to get going quickly. Uh, then you might want a separate CDN if you are looking for something that's truly global, uh, especially for example, CloudFront has some blind spots, like at used to at least have like the Western coast of South America and that kind of stuff. Uh, not, you know, going truly global, not the most use, you know, not the, not the most common case, right? Uh, you're doing a lot of streaming, uh, or you need high customiz customizability on how the CDN works, like that you need to really tinker with the CDN. Then the companies like Fastly and Akamai offer you a lot of power to define how the CDN uh, behaves. And you might be also looking just past just by just past shoveling bytes, like maybe you want to use this image product or web application firewall or bot detection or you know what what ever and you know maybe it makes sense to buy everything from a single provider and get some discounts while doing it uh, or you want to support and you want or you want more support on the cdn side itself like all of these companies offer you a you know a pricing plan of getting just you know more support and they are not actually that badly priced i think so if you actually need dedicated support on the cdn and cdn alone or you have multiple origins like if you have content in both amazon and Google Clouds, and maybe it makes sense to you know not use one or the other, but pick a third party to sit in front of them. Or if you're a crazy person, you can build your own. But you know that has some some stuff, uh, some pre prerequisites, right? You already built that control plane for some reason. Uh, you you are already very good at mingling with people over drinks for free free internet. Uh, you really like to deal with data centers, and you're generally peaking at over one terabit per second like under that capacity you're just going to be bleeding money uh, if you build your own cdn sort of in this team a question i got asked on slack also when i was asking what people want to hear that should you have redundant cdns uh, an example given there was like netlify that they had multiple cdns we used multiple cdns at spotify too so i would say in generally no strategies for a whole cdn provider are extremely rare while you know regional outages and uh, degradation can happen, but nothing says that the regional outage is limited to a single CDN provider. Like it could be just a very badly behaving internet service provider down the line, and you know, irregardless which CDN you use, you might be stuck with it. All the CDNs have a lot of redundancy baked in by default, so like likelihood of them going completely black is very small. Reasons why you might want to have another one and have a dual CDN setup is that well, maybe the CDN is very critical for you. Uh, that was the case with uh, with us at Spotify. Like getting that data, you know, music out of the cloud was sort of very paramount in terms of like listening to music and being able to download it. That said, for example, Netflix is a single CD in in house built. But anyway, for us it was very paramount, so we wanted to have that ability to switch between CDNs if needed. If we did, uh, if we saw that, you know, if we saw that, oh, this is having a bad quality somewhere, we could switch between Akamai Fastly or our own. Also, it might make sense. Like, I think the Netlify, Netlify case is a combo of these two, like as the as Spotify cases too. Like you might operate at a scale, which allows you to haggle with the providers. And if you can actually take multiple providers in and you can show them like, hey, look at Akamai, they're doing faster than you are. Or look at, you know, 
you got look at limelight they're cheaper than you are uh, uh, then you know that gives you a negotiation power with the providers and maybe there's also a case that there's a sing there's no single provider that has the exact features that you absolutely need hope you hopefully you're not in this position i would recommend maybe double checking your features but you know you might end up in there and then you need to pony up maybe two different CDN providers just to get the features in place you need. Closing to the end, uh, what we did not cover in this talk, what it is actually to build, build out your own CDN. Uh, I touched the parts of it, but like the nitty gritty details. Uh, how the CDNs work as business and why is it changing now? This is something I promised in the Tech Weekly intro, but then I ran out of time adding it to the slides. Uh, or why the CDNs are selling all kinds of other services like edge computing, security solutions, and you name it. Uh, and then why are YouTube and Netflix throttling traffic uh, or the bit rates of the video in Europe now during the corona crisis? But I'm happy to talk with you over Slack or over questions here if we have time about all of this stuff. So that's it, I think. Any questions here? Yeah, I, I, I'll i cover it quickly. Juha Matti Santala asked, why does Canada look so empty on the pop map? So I think Fastly doesn't have pops in Canada uh, at the moment. There are CDN providers in Canada, but Canada also is one of those like, it's like Finland and Sweden. Like everyone is in Stockholm, everyone is in the US. So why bother, you know, Seattle, basically Seattle and, and New York both have massive hubs in the US side, which have a very close path to uh, Canada. And and Chicago in the middle, so that I guess that's the part. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so really practical question. I think we come across quite often clients who have a lot of business in in Russia or, or China. So what would be yep. a really practical way to serve content? Say like update packages, something big in those regions. Is is there like a provider that we could just start using? So China, I don't know. Like that's a very different beast. Uh, there are like, I think Alibaba and those all offer a, a some sort of solution in China. Uh, for Russia, every single Russian internet uh, service provider exchanges traffic in Stockholm. So like even between like Russian people within Russia, their traffic routes through Stockholm. And then, you, then there's the, the, Swe the Swedish NSA called FRA. Is they are very happy of this setup also because they get to sniff the Russian traffic, but that means that every single CDN provider who exchanges traffic in Stockholm, which is pretty much every single one because NetNode is a huge uh, IX, they you, you get an access to Russia and it's pretty pretty decent. Akamai actually has pops within Russia, but they are also very careful of not exposing things like. Uh, TLS keys and that kind of stuff within Russian borders because of the legislation there. But most of the people just stay outside Russia and serve traffic via Stockholm. All right, thanks. You're welcome. There's also one part, funny part in the, in the Russia is that they might just you know detect that you're serving uh, sort of illegal content in Russian terms, like uh, LGBTQ content and that kind of stuff, and they might just block an IP. And if they block an IP of a CDN, then the CDNs need to figure out like who's serving the content and slap them on the wrists. It's a very complicated setup. All right. Any other questions? Nope. If there's no more questions now.